Hello and welcome to my program, Elderhood, Aging Gracefully. I extend you that, that aloha experience of Hawaii, that beautiful concept of welcoming people into the company of the whole family with sharing one breath and one life. And I, I don't know all of you, but the, the, like one guy, one uh, famous author said, um, all of you are just friends I have yet to meet. So thank you for coming and being a part of this on-show experience. I'm looking at elderhood, elderhood as a stage of life. You had your childhood, you, we had our adolescence, we've had our adulthood, and now we have a stage called elderhood, I like to say. Uh, elderhood, I want to um, offer you as an opportunity to, uh, with my coaching and with other resources available, re make that experience of life real and wonderful. I've approached this elderhood, and I'm grateful for Think Tank Hawaii for giving me this opportunity to share it with you, but I've approached this stage of life as having five tasks that are called spiritual tasks. Those spiritual tasks beside me here are grieving, sorting out our stories, uh, forgiving, preparing, and letting go. And each one of those has some depth to it that I'm exploring here on this on these programs. Um, the preparing piece, uh, usually when we talk about preparing, of course, we look at the externals. And I, I'm going to look at those with uh, my guest today in just a few minutes. Some of the externals of, that are available, the resources that you want to look into to learn about uh, what elderhood can be and will be when you make some positive health-affirming choices. Uh, there's also an internal dimension to preparing, the internal dimension of imagination. What do you imagine your elderhood to be? If you imagine your elderhood to be some of the old stories that we have had, uh, decrepit, loss of everything, abilities, if we imagine that's what we're going into, we very likely will make that happen. I'm not saying that imagination is everything, but on the other hand, if we think of it as capable of being wonderful and full of health and well-being, then we are very likely to find those resources and to incorporate them into our decision-making and create a new story for us. Now, uh, two weeks ago, my, my guest was, was Mary, Mary um, from Los Angeles, and Mary talked with us about the different stories when we get into uh, uh, this time of life. We bring with us stories from the past, which often are stories like, I have to be fat, I have to be big, I have to, my family, all, everyone in my family has diabetes, I'm going to have diabetes, I'm going to, uh, it goes on and on of what, what, what we, the stories that we tell ourselves and sometimes inherit. Uh, I said to be careful because every time you see your, hear yourself saying, I'm always, that's a story. It's not a reality. It's the story. And you can know what your stories are just by listening to yourself talk. Uh, I also told you that two weeks ago I was going to join, start a new program of health management myself. And uh, part of that, the first piece is with my coach, is weight loss. And uh, you probably can't tell, but I've lost five pounds last week, <laughs> which is an important part of my new journey. I only have 55 left, and I'm going to make it. Um, so grieving, sorting out our stories, forgiving, and preparing ourselves, preparing for an elderhood and for a, a life at the end of life that is full of meaning and significance and wonder. Those are very, uh, this is our opportunity today. And I've likened this to two different kinds of ways of landing an airplane. I came in to land, an airplane, uh, land on an airplane in Asheville, North Carolina, over the Blue Ridge Mountains, and the pilot said, came on and said, we're over thunderstorms. I can't just go through the thunderstorms. We're going to circulate up here above the storms until I find an opening, and then we'll go in. So we were there 10 minutes, came on the line and said, okay, I got an opening. I'm going in. Well, he didn't just take a gradual uh, approach. He dove through the clouds. And everybody was a white knuckle. Uh, everybody it was a white knuckle experience for all of us as he 
as he plunged to the earth and plunged to the uh, landing strip. That's how many of us plan to, are planning to end our lives eventually. That we'll think of ourselves as being above it all, no problems, no problems, even though there may be difficulties that we're in. We're in denial, we are in uh, igno ignoring the facts of what, what, what's before us sometimes, and then suddenly there's a plunge and everybody grabs, grabs their chair and goes, what has happened? We didn't anticipate this. And that's, that's exactly right. We didn't anticipate this. The other kind of approach in elderhood, it seems to me, is like landing in Honolulu. You start off way out over the ocean, and take a nice, gradual, easy approach to the landing strip. Plans are made. You strengthen yourself all along. You get the resources together, like I'm going to do, to lose weight, to become health, healthful, instead of following the old stories that may oftentimes lead to our dis-ease with ourselves and with our life. There are so many amazing resources. We have 250,000 um, residents in Hawaii, over 65, and that's about a quarter of the population, but that's a lot of folks. Fortunately, that has provided uh, impetus for us to have a lot of resources available too, and I'm wanting to introduce you to one of my colleagues from uh, Bristol Hospice, where I am a chaplain, serving as a chaplain, and it's Aaron Hamilton is the Director of Community Development. And I'm so grateful to welcome her to here today. Erin, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Um, and I love what you were saying about how perception is kind of the basis of our preparations in life. Okay. Yeah. Good. Well, Erin, would you just share a little bit about hospice care to start off with? Bristol Hospice, I, I say, and it's because I have, a, I have a great affection for it, is a company that I'm proud to say limits it, I mean, lives out its tagline, which is embracing a reverence for life. And I think we do that. But tell us in general about the benefits of hospice care. What do you see and when you go out to meet with people? What do you, what's on your mind to say, why is it important that I would even consider hospice care at this stage of my life? So I think to kind of just add to your fact about how we just have such a large population of, you know, aging um, people here as well. And then preparation. So I think the biggest thing that we struggle with when we get into the field and when we typically are getting a hospice referral is going to be it's, it's a late referral. So unfortunately, a lot of the time we just don't want to facilitate these discussions with our family members, um, whether it be cultural beliefs or um, kind of just if it's a taboo subject, which I feel like it kind of is for us. You're um, saying even hospice, talking about hospice care yeah, is taboo? Yeah, so I think definitely um, nobody wants to kind of talk about that, you know, that elephant in the room or the gorilla in the corner. And especially now that we have a lot more um, medical advances, we're doing a lot more treatments, you know, it's important to be hopeful, but I think it's also important to kind of just talk about all possibilities. Um, and just be prepared for that as well. So, um, you know, one of the things with hospice care is not only preparing the individual, but as well as the family and giving them support too, like yourself. So they get a chaplain, they get a social worker, they get a registered nurse, case manager, they get a nurse's aide. Um, they have their attending physician as well um, and a physician from the hospice as well. Um, their medical equipment, their medications, that's all a part of it, and it's just what we all paid for. Like when we pay our Medicare taxes, that's where it's going. Um, and I think a big part of that perception is, number one, we don't want to talk about it because it's kind of taboo, or we don't want to offend or give up hope. But at the same time, um, it's important to kind of acknowledge that we're all getting that same ticket mm -hmm, to that same mm -hmm, place, mm -hmm. and let's just try to yeah. embrace, like you are saying, um, the reverence of our lives. And I'd like to say, tag on, uh, ride the coattails of one thing you said, which was um, <clears throat> having the family together. We have a, uh, it's a great advantage to us and to the family when we can bond with the family earlier in the process of uh, it, that dying process, eventual dying process, and really walk the journey alongside them rather than wait until they 
suddenly land in our laps. And, and uh, they're, they're frantic, the family's frantic, the patient's frantic. Um, what's the first prescription for being eligible for hospital, hospice care? Um, the first prescription or? Six months. Yeah, so they would definitely have to have a terminal diagnosis of six months or less by two physicians. Mm -hmm. um, typically, it's going to be the referring physician, the specialist, or but the... Two, two physicians. It would be two, and then usually our physician, the hospice physician, oh, okay. is that second I certification. Okay. Um, but that's nothing usually that the families usually, or the patient usually has to worry about. It's really just kind of taking that leap, and let's just talk <clears throat> about this. Um, because it doesn't mean that you're giving up hope. Mm -hmm. um, and there are, as we would say, hospice graduates, which you kind of know about. Um, mm -hmm. And those are going to be patients that maybe do get a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, and they are able to get off services and maybe pursue a little bit of treatment that they were willing to or wanting to pursue prior. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe they, you know, they gained a little weight or their, their functional ability is a little bit better. And then they can always come back onto hospice services yeah. later on. So if we, if, if, if we have a chance of the, to bond with that family, right at the beginning of getting that news, six months out, there's a death, right. imminent death, probably yeah. in six months. Yeah. And we can bond with them and walk that journey. We can bring all these resources mm -hmm. to bear on the comfort and care and peace of the patient and the family. Absolutely. And then also after. So... I think the biggest part of why patients often do not want to talk about it with their family members is because they don't want to worry them, right? Uh, we don't want to worry them. Burden, oh, yeah. We don't want to burden my children. We don't want to burden my husband or my true, wife. True. But at the same time, you know, when that, that person is no longer here, the family is usually the ones kind of left with that situation to kind of um, deal with. So that support in terms of like the chaplain, the social yeah, work, yeah. and the bereavement is offered even after the, the no We've got here. about a one minute to break, Erin. Sure. I'm sorry, I took a long time talking at no, first. No. Um, what is one or two? What are one or two aspects of Bristol Hospice that you think set them set that service apart from the others on the island? Oh, definitely. So I think then the first thing is that we offer a lot of palliative care. So I think that you know a lot of the time people think that hospice is only for end of life or the uh -huh. last few hours, uh -huh. but we can do palliative radiation, we can do IV hydration, a lot of things oh. that maybe 10 years ago or even presently some other hospices wouldn't be interested in doing. So I would say the, the palliative services. Palliative means to cover. Um, I yeah. don't know if you have ever, you know what pallbearers are. Yeah. They, they took care of the covering over the casket, which was right. the pall. So palliative comes from that same word. Yeah. To cover the pain, to cover the anguish, and to ease life then through that. Is there one more thing about Bristol that you think is really wonderful? Oh, I would say that we have um, amazing staff like yourself oh, and gosh. our clinical staff. Our medical directors are really, really involved. Our nurses are just super caring. Um, and we do probably the most nursing visits um, Beautiful. With, with our patients. That's important, Beautiful. especially We're going to come back and look at, at some resources that are available in this Community, Erin has an amazing website I want to introduce you to, and uh, please stick with us. Aloha, I'm Jane Sawyer with the Small Business Administration and one of your hosts for Adventures in Small Business, a partnership with ThinkTech and with the Hawaii Small Business Development Center, the Mink Center for Business and Leadership, and the Veteran Business Outreach Center, all serving small businesses in Hawaii and telling you the story about their strategies, their ideas, their drive, and the way they help Hawaii succeed and be a bright light in small business. You'll find it here every Thursday at ThinkTech. Thanks for joining us, and we hope to see you soon. Aloha, this is Rob Hack. My show is Exporting from Hawaii every other Thursday from 12 to 12.30 p.m., where I bring in People involved in the entire exporting infrastructure in Hawaii, including government, academia, and manufacturers and shippers themselves. Please join me every other Thursday, 12 to 12.30 p.m. on Exporting from Hawaii. Mahalo. We're back here from Honolulu. And uh, the program is elderhood, aging gracefully, and I am convinced 
with the help of folks like my client or my my companion here uh, today, we can age gracefully into and through our elderhood, which is a stage of life. Thanks for being a part of this, and thanks for Think Tech Hawaii and all that they make available to us to share these uh, explorations to to challenge our intellects and to enable me to share with you some of the coaching a basis of my own coaching for elderhood, which I would do with you if that's something that you would like to get involved in. Um, Aaron Hamilton is our Director of uh, Community Development at, at Bristol Hospice. Aaron, what about this website? You have an amazing website that you introduced me to, and Eric will pull it up here for us sure. and share a little bit about first about uh, how you decided to get into it and how did you decide to develop it? Sure. So I think it was definitely being in the field um, and definitely along the themes of the show is preparation. And when I would meet families, I would say the most the common denominator that a lot of people shared was just not being prepared on so many aspects of it and not really having the access to the resources that even the professionals in the field, we struggle with, you know, getting all the new updates and everything like that. Um, so that was kind of the, the catalyst for me to start a website. And I just wanted to make sure that everybody in the public had access to all of this information that we get a kind of um, experience in our day-to-day -day lives at yeah. work. Erin is a trained uh, certified social worker and uh, has moved into this, this role, having also served as the liaison for Bristol Hospice, which means that she connects with people who are coming into the service. So if Eric will bring that up now, we'll, sure. we'll start to use that as you think might be best. Sure. So I would say definitely um, in terms of, you know, your quick kind of go-to, you can look at the community resource library um, and go ahead and click that. And you can just click on resource library and it's going to give you a list of topics. So I think one of the first things on the list is going to be the advanced healthcare directive and the pulse. So if we click on that, um, that's going to bring you to kind of an area that will explain what the Advanced Healthcare Directive is, um, the power of attorney or the living will. Um, and then also, if you scroll a little bit down, it's going to have four different options for you. So you can click on the Advanced Healthcare Directive, you can click on the POLST, which a POLST is the Physician's Orders for Life Sustaining Treatment. Um, and that's probably going to be bright green paper that a lot of you have probably seen. Um, and you can really just look at the different topics there and see what are the choices and what that means to you. This became, can be completed at any time in your life and as many <coughs> times as you want and can be changed. Um, and then a just, doctor is needed. Just as an aside, I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, because I'm here alone, my, my girls, my daughters are in, in Denver, Colorado, so I didn't have anybody. I thought, you know, if, if I have an accent, how is anybody going to know what to do? And so I filled out my polls and I filled out my advanced directives with a piece called Five, Easy, Five Wishes. And I've made that available to my physician. I even gave it to my business, to, to, uh, to uh, my supervisor. So, yeah, I really think any time of your life, it's important to have that in place. Absolutely. You think so? Huh? Absolutely. So um, we'll go back to the... And website. then if you go back to the website um, and look under the resources library, you can go back to resource library as well. Um, I think a large portion of this as well is um, as we age, there's going to be different challenges in our lives and different levels of care that you may need. So housing is usually um, one of the most complicated issues to really navigate, like in especially when we're in a hospital setting, maybe we're meeting the families there or we're meeting them at home and there's an anticipated decline in whatever disease state they're um, currently being challenged with. Um, there's different options. So there's a care home, a foster home, a nursing facility, assisted living facilities. Um, and then, of course, there are going to be, you know, patients that do not even have a home or housing available, so that would be more like a transitional or emergency, emergency shelter situation. Um, a lot of people do not know necessarily about the community care foster homes, and that's a good way of kind of navigating um, this as well. That's more of a home setting. So if you click on that link right there, it's going to redirect you to the, uh, the government site of all the certified licensed foster homes, their addresses, their phone numbers, their contact information as well. So you can find, you know, if it's for mom or dad, 
you can see who's the nearest one to you. Um, and then when you go back to the resource library as well, let's say maybe the foster home situation is not for you um, and you want to go ahead and look at maybe the skilled nursing facilities um, and housing. under housing. Um, there's also the assisted living and senior community. So we can click on the assisted living and senior communities tab. And that's going to really just talk to us about what is the difference between an assisted living situation, um, a retirement, and a senior community. Um, so, you know, the assisted living facilities are going to offer, you know, your meals, they're going to do your laundry. Um, but what does that look like financially? Um, and really kind of just, again, going back to the, the idea of preparation wow. and planning. So Wonderful. you can go through that whole tab and just really check out each one. And maybe there's going to be a part of your life where, you know, doing assisted living is going to work or another when you'll maybe need a foster mm -hmm, home mm -hmm. or a nursing facility. But at least having that accessibility mm -hmm. to those resources are so important. So I, I, I want to be in my, in my if I, uh, I want to be in my own home. Um, <clears throat> let's say I, I have a six months to death to dying uh, prognosis for whatever reason. And I get in touch with Bristol Hospice, and I say I want to die. I want to stay at home as long as I can. So, what are the financial arrangements? Let's say that I'm sure. staying at home, and how can I have help with? Because I don't know. There's no, yeah. <laughs> no way that I can uh, do it on my own. But Absolutely. what about? What are the financial arrangements available? for the rest of that six months for me. Yeah, absolutely. So definitely I would say the most common thing is most people want to stay in their home, right? That's very, very normal. That's what we all usually want, nine out of ten of us. So hospice services are paid for by Medicare when you're in the home setting. Or, Medicare. Right, correct. So when you're 65 and older, it's going to be Medicare. If you're 65 and under, it's going to be either your, you know, your typical insurance that you have, whether uh, that be HMSA or Kaiser or Medicaid. Okay. That would cover it as well. Um, and then if you have, let's say you have an HMSA plan, some of them will actually pay for you in, to be in a nursing facility. But again, if that's not the route that you want to go, your Medicare or your normal insurance would pay for that to be in your home setting. That would include your entire staff, your interdisciplinary group. Okay. So that chaplain, all the nurses and medical help, as well as uh, the medical equipment and medications as well to help sustain you in your home setting. When I worked in Denver, a hospice in Denver, in the Denver area, it was set up as a long-term care facility. That's how it was established, but specializing in hospice care. Yeah. So we had patients who were there for several years on long-term care, <clears throat> and then we would recertify them every six months for, for their eligibility to, for, um, for hospice care within our facility. I understood that the facility we went that direction in the first place so that Medicaid could be used for room and board. Is that sure. accurate? Yeah, so if a person qualifies, I think the big thing, and actually if you go to the website too as well, there's a section for what is Medicare and what is Medicaid. So I think the, I often hear those, those terms kind of switched back and forth. And really the difference is gonna be Medicare is, if again, we're 65 and older, Medicaid's gonna be based on financial criteria. If a person meets financial criteria, they would be able to, the hospice benefit pays for them in the room and board situation in a, in a long-term care setting like that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. What else? Um, so if we're going to go back to the main resource library um, on the website, I would say that um, a big part of it is definitely like kind of what you're talking about is support groups and senior centers as well. So, you know, really just talking to everyone in your situation, in your circle, and just finding others to connect with and see what has worked for them and what hasn't worked for them and really just getting that feedback as well. Um, so you can go and click on the different links and see, you know, in your town or your zip code, which mm -hmm. support mm -hmm. groups or senior centers are available. Mm -hmm. So I think that's definitely resourceful as well. So. There's a lot of resources out there, um, so many. So even dependent upon your diagnosis. So let's say you know you have uh, renal disease or Alzheimer's or mom and dad um, has Alzheimer's or dementia. A lot of the time too, the resources are there for the family members, right? Because right. yes, the patient's going through it too, but then the family members, the spouse are going through it as well um, and often just need someone to 
touch base with and kind of reflect about what they're going through. Yeah. Yeah. Cicely Saunders, who originated hospice care, was a social worker, a physician, a nurse, and um, a self-proclaimed member of, of her Church of England. <laughs> <laughs> and she identified uh, four different pains in that. There was a social pain of relationship with others and financial issues. Sometimes there was a, a pain of uh, the physical pain, of course, medical pain. I mean, medically addressed. There was the pain of, of um, uh, what was the third one here? Oh, the, and then the fourth one, the spiritual pain. But uh, the, the, she built the hospice care around those four pains and really around her own personality. So we inherited that. Yeah. And our interdependent or interdisciplinary team is made up of those folks, the social worker, the medical director, nurse and CNA, the um, uh, bereavement caregiving for community, and then also spiritual care. So all hospice attempts to do that. Bristol Hospice has its own special abilities, I think. This goes, this is gonna go global. Um, I have friends in Sweden and other places or Finland who are gonna watch this. <laughs> so um, it's applicable anywhere, but your specific, I mean the general categories, but your specific offering of this, um, of this website is just a gem, Erin. Thank, thank you. And I know you've done this out of your own selfless desire to help. And uh, thank you very much. And I just want to throw it out there that it's 100% free. There's no signing up or anything like that. Anyone can access it. Um, and the more we know, the better we can prepare and make decisions. So thank you so much for having me. It is just a really a pleasure, Erin. Thank me you. Too. Thank you. Uh, in, my, in my coaching, I want, you, I want to help you make your elderhood real and wonderful. And uh, I can do that through groups. I can do it online with you individually. Um, make it make it real make it wonderful